Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Dyslexia Life Hacks Show. My name is Matthew Head. Today, we have on Alison Egger, the entrepreneur's godmother. However, before she earned that title, she actually struggled at school and spent quite a lot of time working in sales, where she overachieved. After all this, she decided to make the brave decision in 2014 to start her own business, which helps entrepreneurs to start up. She's been twice voted one of the UK's top 10 business advisors. She has two number one best-selling books, Secret Success of Sales, and recently just come out, Smash It. She's a public speaker, been on the BBC, and if that's done enough, she's also been to a royal garden party. Welcome to the show, Alison. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. That's okay. Um, I thought I'd ask first, because I'm really curious, what's it like to receive an MBE? Do you know what? Shock. I think <laughs> shock. Um, so for anybody that doesn't know what an MBE is, twice a year, um, the Queen um, honours people for different things. So you can get like services to allotments or marrow grown or whatever but a lot of the famous people you know, things like Joe Wicks got an MBE Marcus Rashford got an MBE the same time that I did mm. um, so I literally I think I went into shock but the other thing was <laughs> you're not allowed to tell MD so this was like I found out in June 2020 okay. and normally you can tell people in July 2020 but because they were honouring the COVID heroes we weren't allowed to tell anybody till October so I'm October. rubbish at keeping secrets <laughs> so I had to do a big secret and, and in my head so it went from shock to excitement to then I had to just kind of forget about it and then when it came out I shock and tears and but I haven't been to the palace yet so I get to go to Buckingham Palace to get my investiture from either the Queen or Princess Anne um, Prince William or Prince Charles, I think, are the only ones that do the investiture. So, or Princess right, Anne. Yes. So, um, so, I think it will become a wee bit more real when I've got my little medal thing. What I'm going to do with the medal, I've no idea. But uh, yeah, it's exciting <laughs> as well. I'm so excited. And again, you know, coming from a humble start, I came from a working class background. I left school at 16, undiagnosed dyslexia. But um, I think it proves that you can actually achieve things maybe not in the conventional way, um, yes, with the, yes, non, the non-neurodiverse people, whereas we can do it in a neurodiverse way. Yeah, yeah. You got a particular preference to who you'd like to bestow you with the medal? <laughs> um, I'll, 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 literally, obviously, the Queen would be amazing because yes, we don't have many years left. She'll do it, and I don't even know she's doing it anymore. But Princess Anne, I think <laughs> I walk down right, and I think she's quite gutsy. I really, you know, I look at her, and I, she's quite outspoken, and you know, she does rock Princess Anne. So that would be my second choice, Princess uh, Anne. Yeah, <laughs> I can see that. I'd, uh, I, I might go for Prince William because he's actually ridden a motorbike. I've had a hand in designing so maybe <laughs> that'd be nice fun. there you go <laughs> so you did mention through that your uh start from a humble background and you cover it quite a lot in your first book but i sort of thought i'd dive in a little bit heavier considering the topic of this podcast into the dyslexia side of it and it seems to be a kind of thing i'm finding out quite a lot of people get, get found out later on in life whether it's their children or they hand in a report because they're a late start at uni i mean i found out at the late old age of six <laughs> that I was dyslexic, <laughs> but I feel like an outlier. So I was interested, how did you, when did you find out and how did that process go? Well, I think it's quite interesting because now when we see dyslexia or dyspraxia or neurodiversity, more and more people know what it is. But I, yeah. I, don't, I don't even know if I had, an, I, again, this would have been the, the, I mean, I started school in, I started high school in 1979. Oh, I'm giving my age away now. <laughs> uh, so I don't even know. It was obviously a thing, but I don't know if it had a name of a thing at that stage. And for me, there was a couple of things. I'm I'm bright and I'm I'm quite. I'm quite sparky, so I can I could hide the flaws, if that makes sense. And I could overcome them and sit next to the clever people and go, how do you spell this? And what does that mean? And, you know, I could do all that stuff. But I think one of the things that really caught me out when I realised this doesn't feel normal, I don't feel like everyone else, was in English class. And again, this is 1979 in English class in Scotland, even doing Shakespeare <laughs> or doing, you know, quite heavy, heavy books. 
and you had to stand up and read a paragraph out loud. And oh, I yes. just, uh, again, I can't even get the words out. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I had to work out ways. You know, like you hear about people who tried to get out a PE with a sick note. I was yeah. like that with like, oh my goodness, I, I think I don't feel very well. I think I have to go to the nurse. And, or, oh, I can't read today because I've got a sore throat. I would always find an excuse of not to read. And, and even when I did, it was embarrassing because it was like a five year old child, you know, their cat sat on their mat and it, there would be, it was, and especially Shakespeare, you know, Shakespeare of all the things, you know. Yeah, so, not only um, is it normal language, you've got the thespian old English to tackle with. It's <laughs> just, oh. <laughs> Awful, awful. So other people seemed to be able to do it and it seemed that I was in the minority of the people that couldn't read, but I never really let it hold me back, if that makes sense. And I think I compensated by building really strong friends and having a good friendship group in the class. So I didn't get the mickey taken out of me and I had I found ways to overcome. I think that's what I'd say, find ways to overcome. And it was then... Only when I was in my, uh, I think, late 20s, early 30s, mm-hmm. I had, I was, work, but this time I had come back to the UK, I'd been travelling, come back to the UK, and I was selling advertising space for Yellow Pages at the time, because, oh, <laughs> Matthew, there was no internet, and I don't mean the Wi-Fi was down, I mean the internet wasn't around, we had to use, <laughs> like, boots and things. Oh, oh, I remember shopping for a car insurance by using the Yellow Pages. Yeah. I mean, I- you know, there's none of that internet stuff, no, no grammarly, no. none of that. No, and no. <laughs> um, I had gone to see an optician. One of the, not I'd gone to see an optician to get my eyes done, but that was one of the clients was an optician. Oh, and okay. Spooners, the name of the optician was Spooners and it was in Bristol. Okay. And I had said to the guy, because at that stage we had to write things out manually and, you know, oh, I'm trying to write the copy for the, the, the advert. And, uh, and he said, um, are you dyslexic? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm, 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 I'm sorry, is that, what is that? What, what is this thing <laughs> talk of, this dyslexia? And he said, oh, you know, it's when you're not, you know, connecting the dots and, you know, you might miss out the words. And I went, I do that all the time. I said, how would I know if I was dyslexic? And he said, oh, let me do a quick test for you. Let me, and he put the coloured frames on the, the, the words and all that kind of stuff. And he said, oh, yeah, yes, you're definitely dyslexic. So I think, I don't, I think knowing that I wasn't just a wee bit weird and a wee bit strange, helped my my confidence was always high because I found coping strategies when I was young for anything that I couldn't do but I think knowing that I wasn't just a weirdo that couldn't read gave me um, strength (laughs) to believe that I could make that be even I could be even stronger in my strengths and not focus too much on the things that I couldn't do. So did you ever feel like you were stupid or got called stupid when you were younger or were you just that weirdo instead? Yeah, I was weird. I, I, again, I, I touch wood. I can't remember people calling me st- stupid. I can't remember going, oh, well, she's really stupid. She can't read. Because I I had already found a coping strategy and people to surround myself that didn't care whether I could read or not. They liked me for being me. So I think that early on, you know, even though I didn't know there was what, why I felt, I felt stupid. But I found a way that people wouldn't call me stupid because I compensated with the things I was really good at. So I was really good with people. I was a really good friend. I was, you know, I'm not, I was never a class clown, but I was always quite um, amiable and always got on. I was quite, um, I was quite good at golf. So there was always <laughs> ways that I could like work around that people wouldn't call me stupid. They might think it, but they never said it out loud. So that wasn't something I had to deal with because I had already put a coping strategy in place. Okay. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I had a, a female barrister, probably similar age group to you. And one of the key, key things we found out on her episode was she was never called stupid either. And she just carried on striving through uh, sort of some other people's experience. The stupid thing really gets them down. I think. So that's, that's quite yeah. nice that your coping strategy, you balance the whole thing out. And as I know a total, it sounds, really, a, it sounds yeah. really random, Matthew, but I, I've always been quite a, a, a big girl. 
so I was more concerned that people called me fat. They used to call me fat before. <laughs> this, guy, this guy, Peter, I could remember, like, he used to live down by my granny. And be like, who's afraid of fat McCall? Fat McCall. And I'm like, that, that got on my nerves more. Oh, the people I see. I was stupid. Do you know what uh, I mean? So maybe there was just other things going on at that time. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> priorities i see <laughs> yeah 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 I, I was more concerned and i think as a female as well you yeah. are you know at that stage when you're going through puberty and you are young and you are at school you do concern yourself with a lot of the stuff that actually what you look like if that makes sense so yeah yeah i can um, sort of understand you know, it I was never worried about being called fat, but I was always the tallest one. So being called lanky was my kind of thing. <laughs> See, I, but then everybody's got a thing that's not, everybody's flawed. There's not exactly. one person that's not flawed. So it's it's what you use for your flaw. Like it's great being tall because when you go to a concert, you can see the stage in the bands, but all the short people can't. Exactly. So again, or you could think, oh, I stand out a lot because I'm tall, people see me. Well, you know, and that's that. I think it's finding the strength in the flaw. Also, don't have a secondary use of the Hello Pages. <laughs> <laughs> so, you you drop out of school. No, you don't drop out of school, but you finish school and find yourself into sales. Do you think sort of some of your dyslexic thinking led you to sales? Because sales seems to be a lot of talking. In my outsider's view, I'm an engineer and don't do sales at all. You do be a lot of sort of talking and it's more charisma wise and coming up with ad campaigns and visualizing things in place than it is text heavy or you've got a copywriter, I think they're called to do that for you. <laughs> do you think that was sort of your brain finding its root of least resistance into a job that really worked for you? Yeah, I mean, I think that came a wee bit later. So from school, I ended up working in hospitality. I became a hotel mm. receptionist. So straight from school, I became a hotel receptionist. And I think what that did actually allowed me to use my creativity. I know that sounds obscure, but when I got the job in the first place, I thought a hotel receptionist gave out keys. But I thought that's all you did. <laughs> well, here's a key. Check it out. Thank you. I did literally think that that's all you did. Did you rehearse that small... routine in the mirror before you started? I did. Checking <laughs> it. Checking it. But what I didn't realise in a small hotel actually you do everything so apart from cook because that's they don't nobody wants to eat my food but I used to cash off all the bars so I did every piece of cash that would come through the hotel would come through me and again no computers Matthew I had to do everything <laughs> in the manual tab so like the reservations was manual tab the the bookkeeping was manual tab you know I used a calculator or rubber so actually I quite like numbers I think that's where I, I quite like the numbers side I can understand how to work that also like when it came to the function side I would be again I've got a really good head for organization my head works really well in the fact that I'm highly organized and I can I can overcome problems so again I think that's one of the superpowers of dyslexia that yeah um so I can remember I would be 17 years of age and I would be MC in a wedding. I mean, literally me with my gavel. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the bride and the groom. You know, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> yes. And I didn't have that fear. And and even like, so say I was running the food and beverage and say somebody was off sick for like serving the potato silver service or whatever, I could always go, mm. well, you take that section, I'll do that. So I think that that I, I really flourished on my superpowers that everything else like typing the menus again <laughs> we used to have one of these little typewriters that it was before computers right and you would type it in in a little tiny screen and then it would go and it would print the menu well I used to have to use the tipex because I'd made all the words wrong and the spacing <laughs> wrong and and I couldn't I, my, my brain couldn't equate typing the chef's um, paper menu to me typing it into the menus for the restaurant. So that, that that's where the gap was. So what I would try and do is I would say to one of the other receptionists, can you do that bit and I'll do this bit? So there was always a way that I could try and offload the bits that really were affecting what I did. So, But then I went travelling for six years, still in hospitality, and then I came back and that's when I moved into sales. And I think the skills that I had learned, the I would say that my um, emotional intelligence is high. And that really helped for sales. I would say that my entrepreneurial side, the creativity side was high and that helped with sales. So I think, again, it was just always focusing on those things that really made me unique and positive. 
Yeah, I see. Yeah, so you you basically just focused so hard on all of the strengths that they absolutely annihilated any weak point that somebody might have. Yeah, people didn't notice. I don't think yeah. that people really noticed because I didn't I didn't fly the flag. I just concentrated on the things I was great on, and all they could see were the real, you know, the the shiny star points of me yeah. rather than the other side. And it's very cunning, um, or not cunning, but a good way of learning delegation. To, <laughs> to, uh, yeah, pass, I was really good at people. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To, but even to this day, you know, you've you've interacted with my team. Like they, you I obviously talk about dyslexia now because I think it's important. Yeah, that, I agree. Uh, I, the reason I talk about it is not to go, oh, poor me, I'm dyslexic. But actually, if you surround yourself with the right people, actually, if you set the right goals, actually, if you take action and, and stay positive and stay focused, you can do anything. This can be something that propels you rather than drags you back. Uh, yes, I agree. It's one of the reasons this podcast exists to kind of put that out there. It's like, it's not, it's not what I believed all the way through till I was about 35. <laughs> so, and it is quite important that people do hear that it's, yeah, dyslexia is superpower or the gift of dyslexia. Actually, you have, you can really shine some strong skills that cover over some of the weak ones, or actually, you can find people who will coach you on how to mitigate them. And then you've suddenly got all the strong skills with not as many weak points, which is even better. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so you found out when you were still working at the Yellow Pages about being dyslexic. Did that change any of your approach? Did you go search out any help or guidance, or did you just go, oh, it's that, but carry on? Well, it's, it's so it's so interesting because, you know, this would then have been the 90s, you know, skip 20 oh, yeah. years. So this is like, the, you know, or maybe the, I don't know what year it was, but it was it was kicking around. It was about the same time as Oasis or Singing <laughs> Wonderwall. So whatever time that was. 96. And, um, yeah, you know, it was about that time. And, and what I then had to do when I worked at Yale, we have to we had to sit like a test every year, like a written examination on what you would know about the skills and you know the the how to create content and copy and and every year we had to and again it came back that's when the memories would come flooding back of reading mm. out loud in English and I, I'd say to my sister my sister's a pharmacist she's not um, dyslexic and she would say you should tell them you're dyslexic. You need extra time for your test. Yeah. Right? And I said, no, no, honestly, I don't think that's going to make a, a, a difference at all. And, and I think this is the, you know, you look now at bigger organisations, you know, you look at EY, you know, you look at big organisations like Yale, it's acknowledged now that people are not stupid. And it's not that they can't spell and it's not that they're not trying. It's actually that they've got, neurodiversity and and mm. they they take that strength as what it is they help them now whereas before if somebody maybe was good at sales they were really bad at paperwork you know and <laughs> then what they would do is they would hide the paperwork in the boot I mean I, I know people and it, you know it's only as later on when I reflect back on that time they were scared of the paperwork because they probably didn't know how to fill it in they were great at sales getting people to say yes but they couldn't create that paperwork journey for the client because they just were too frightened or it just was too hard for them. And I think that's where touch wood. I, I've always thought, well, if I take my time and because I'm organised, I think because <laughs> I'm highly organised, that's another superpower that I have. Yes, that that yes. made it easier for me because I, I, I quite like the paperwork. You know, I, I liked... I didn't like doing the writing bit, but I love to tick the box. I've completed that task. Oh, you, did you have like a big long to-do list and love ticking it all off? Well, I mean, even now, you know, you've read both the books. I talk about Alison Edgar's Big Balls because I, I think the to-do <laughs> list is really hard. So I've translated to-do lists into how do you manage your time as basketballs, tennis balls and ping pong balls. And again, if you look at that from a, a, a neurodiverse side, it's visual. So yes. if I think, right, okay, so what have I got in my diary? Right, I've got to be with Matthew at half past six. That's my basketball. And then what I've got to do is fit the other things around it. So I'll do my tennis balls and, you know, really focusing. I can see my diary randomly as basketballs, tennis balls and ping pong balls. Yes, I, I really like because I've it's the jar of sand analogy kind of it comes, it feels like it comes from 
And yeah, I'm, it comes actually going back further than that. It's the Eisenhower quadrant. So like yes, Stephen Covey, yes, you yes. know, translated it into the jars in the sand, but yeah. that wasn't his. And and it's interesting because you know I've obviously doing this work in the personal development space, and do you know what? I don't think there's anything new. It's just a different spin, and it's the spin that works for you. You know, and I think the reason that the sands in the jar worked is because you can see it. You know, that yeah. doesn't fit. These don't fit, and it's the same sort of thing. Yeah, it's. I'm listening to quite your. I've listened to both your books in audio because in the car and stuff. And um, one of the things I noticed you do really well is paint pictures. Like I, as you were doing <laughs> Alice's big balls, which initially made me laugh because all the innuendo. <laughs> but uh, and then you're like your basketball and your tennis balls and you. And I've got them bouncing around like a in my head a squash court, and I'm like, yeah, I could really see that. And every one of the things I enjoyed about reading your books was that every kind of point you come out with has this really vivid visualization of story that ends up, in my brain anyway, and maybe that's because I'm also neurodiverse, draws this nice picture in. So actually, I remember quite a lot what you've said in your book by the picture that conjures up the moment you mention one of your kind of philosophies. Um, <laughs> I'm now it's, thinking about the big wave. It's when I got hit by the big yes. wave and me on the day back. And, and, and I think it's that fear, isn't it? So, and maybe because I am neurodiverse, I talk to neurodiverse people because they understand it. But I think actually I try and keep it as simple as I can so that everybody can understand it. And if if you want academic, if you want eyes and hair quadrant, then you don't really want to work with me. You don't work with me, go <laughs> work with an academic. That's great. Oh, see you later. And yeah, I, but again, yeah. I think it's about staying true to your message. And I, I see myself as a translator of highbrow academic into something that, everybody can understand and, and especially the neurodiverse community and I think I take one for the team to try and do that to stop people who may feel stupid from feeling stupid because I can translate it into something that they can easily understand and easily implement. Yes I, and I think it certainly stuck in my brain and I remember Jock Boyle who was on a previous episode mentioned that he got your first book and because you were dyslexic it spoke directly to him and I think that is the dyslexic strength, isn't it? Be able to verbalize and paint all these stories. Do you, something I'm finding interesting as I'm learning, how do you find explaining something to neurotypical? So you talk about one of many things in your book that you paint images for. So Alice's big balls being one of them and the, the big wave being another. How do you find if you're telling something neurotypical, do they come along with you on that? Or do you find they, do you have to sort of modify it at all or? No, because I think because I've made it as simple as I can. I mean, everybody yeah. knows what a basketball is, a tennis ball and a ping pong ball. You might yep. not like it. And again, it's interesting what you say about, you know, the innuendo behind it because it was never really created with an innuendo. It was literally basketball, tennis balls, ping pong balls. And if people say it with innuendo, then that, that's a them thing. That's not a me thing. But I do think the neurotypical see more of the innuendo. You know, some, again, some people don't like my content and I don't have a problem with that. You know, and I'll give you an example that on LinkedIn, um, somebody put out a post and LinkedIn, uh, that's the biggest generator of work for me. So from a sales training perspective, from a leadership training perspective, from a speaking perspective, most of the work comes through LinkedIn. So I'm really active on there. But one of the coping strategies I've got on my Mac, I've got a thing called Fiona. So I highlight the text right. and I've set it to Scottish, right? Of, so of course, it's yeah. a little bit like me. And Fiona <laughs> reads back what I've written. So I go through paragraph by paragraph because usually I'm missing the as, the there's, the there, and I'm mm. getting the there's. And, you know, it's a bit messy. So Fiona reads it back and I can auditory hear if I've missed a word or if it's not in the right context or, you know, I can listen back and then I can do the amendments from there. So that's why when I'm putting a LinkedIn post out, I try and do that so that I don't get the LinkedIn grammar police on my case. Yeah, but yeah. there's another guy that I know who um, he flies the flag as well for neurodiversity. And he had commented on a post so it came up on my feed and somebody was saying, you know, what do you think of people who can't spell? Like, this is, you know, we talk about controversial. What do you think about people? And and you should have seen the vile comment. Well, I would give them a job um, as a tour guide, but I wouldn't give them a job doing admin. And, and these people were not joking. This was not a joke. This was <sighs> literally. And I said, look, you know, 
would you be making that humour with somebody with a physical disability? You know, if somebody only had one arm or one leg, would you be standing here on LinkedIn and posting away and ripping them off and ripping them apart? You would not. No, you have no. no idea how vile these comments are. Anyway, the guy came back to me and went, I think you're overreacting. I'm going to get you barred from LinkedIn. And I'm like, because this is where all my work comes from. So I had to kind of stand down and block them and all that kind of stuff. But it, it's it's just um, awful to watch it, you know, to, to see things like that, and just how people react. And I think somebody has to take one for the team. And I think it's if I put a post out and somebody says, oh, you know, why would I want to work with you? You don't even know how to spell. You know, I think get lost. I, I delete you and block you because you're not the kind of person I want to work with anyway. So, um, and, think, and your your business is not English literature and spelling, is it? Your business is being the entrepreneur's godmother. <laughs> it is, but then that that's why again a lot of people can't see. They can't. They just can't see that. So that's not the kind of people that I want to either, either be connected to or working with. I don't. I just don't want to do it. I don't need to. Why would I subject myself? Because you know, I talk about not feeling stupid. But when somebody's you know saying those things, mm. they, you know, you're not made of leather. You know, eventually some of that stuff is going to actually you know sink in and, and start to hurt your feelings. And I think that's where you can't build the wall high enough if you have got those people in your network because you don't want them. You don't want people that, that talk to you like that. You wouldn't take it in the real the real world. Why would you take it in the virtual world? No, no it's, it's, yeah, exactly. I, I completely agree with you. It's why, why, why do people feel they need to be horrible about something like that when you put a post on LinkedIn trying to help other people? It's just, I, some people just, I don't know. <laughs> priorities because they probably could go get a a coach that does a similar thing to you that may not be as good as you but can spell brilliantly and yeah but then that's that's where you know are they as creative can they help them think outside the box no they can't so crack on yeah crack on yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) come back to me in a few years (laughs) yeah i agree do you um so you said you got fiona reading out loud is that on your mac do you um use i'm gonna say siri and see if my phone kicks off um to talk the messages into your phone in the first place. It's one of the get rounds I sometimes use. Um, well, I would if I wasn't Scottish, but they don't understand what I say. <laughs> <laughs> I've, got that, I've got the problem that it never comes out with anything that I say because it's like, it just is. It's like that um, YouTube. Have you seen the YouTube thing for 11 when the guy, two Scottish guys get into a lift and they're trying to go to school <laughs> number 11 and they're going, 11. 11 and it's a voice activated lift so you have to watch this if you haven't seen it so no oh, I no. really struggle I'll, with I'll any that in of the show the, notes yeah literally with any of the um the tools that take your voice and translate uh, them it doesn't work with a Scottish accent very much I went to university in Aberdeen and um I went sort of later on in life. So I used to be a lorry mechanic before that. So my part-time job was back being a lorry mechanic because <laughs> why not? And we sat there and they're like all of the people look at heavy Aberdonian accents and like series rubbish. It doesn't work. They have got an iPhone in the middle. I'm like, what do you mean? And it does exactly. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and they storm off. <laughs> yeah, don't do it. There's, a, there's another YouTube I'm not going to say because it's quite sweary, but there's another woman that's trying to get Alexa to play um, What's <laughs> Cooking, I think it is. Play Dana What's Cooking or something like that. And literally she's having a full-on fight. Oh. Never get, never get, Siri and, uh, oh, the other one, I'm not going to say the names. Never get she into should a not fight be named. with a Scottish <laughs> woman when she's been drinking because you're never going to win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's um who's that Scottish comic and he he, he does a whole sketch about booking cinema tickets and he's like, yeah, you know, it doesn't oh, understand doesn't that, understand anything yeah. apart from the word Glasgow. <laughs> 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 so just so I've I've seen the mobile phone personal assistant stuff don't work. So does that write you off being able to use stuff software like Dragon actually speaking, sort of more bespoke stuff? Um I think, you know, it's really quite interesting because that my head doesn't work in that way. Oh, I, okay. I, 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 it, it doesn't, I can't, like you're asking me questions and I can reply. Yeah. But I, I couldn't formulate. So when it came to the books, because I think this is important for the, you know, as, as a dyslexic, how the hell did I manage to write two books? And Oh, yeah, I was going to ask you on that. <laughs> yeah. So I needed help because a lot of the stuff gets stuck between my ears so yeah, I feel it's like having a big motorway in your head 
but you have to come out yeah. of a, onto a small B road for it to come out onto a page. Is kind of my analogy of that. Yeah, but then if somebody's driving the car for you, then you can make it on that B road. So I think I, I write the books. The content is mine, and it comes from my ears. Yes. And a lot of the stuff, you know, Secrets of Successful Sales was a sort of an easier book to write on hindsight. Hindsight's a great thing. But <laughs> I, I didn't think I could write. I think this is really important for the listeners that, you know, for years, I, I can't write. I'm dyslexic. I can't write. I can't write. And I told myself that I can't write. The choir. So, yeah. So one day, literally, I said to my team, I've got a great team. Again, they're all young. They're all spirited. And again, they've all got degrees in English literature. Or the, at this time, they had degrees in English literature. <laughs> Surround yourself said, with people um, with the strengths you don't yeah, have. Yeah, it's yeah, that yeah. delegation thing. You know, I learned that at an early age. And I said <laughs> to the girls, uh, they said, oh, we're going to write a blog today on this and a blog today on that. And I went, oh, I can't write a blog. And then one day I went, right, stop. And they all went, what do you mean stop? And I said, right, why am I not writing the blogs? And they're like, Alison, we don't know. Why are you not writing the blogs? <laughs> and I said, I'm going to write a blog. And they laughed, right? And they were like, you go, you go, girl, you write that blog. We're behind you 100%. So I wrote the blog, which is in the first book about yes. sales and marketing being like golf. So I wrote this blog yes. about sales and marketing being like golf and it was 500 words. I put it out on LinkedIn and it went mad. People loved it. They absolutely loved it because I translated a subject into something that was relatable and it gave me a wee bit of a va va to say, I'm going to write. I'm, I'm good at this. People love it. I'm going to do more. <laughs> so I kept on, I broke it into these short blogs. So maybe between 500 and 700 words, I was quite clean on the topic. It was stuff that I taught anyway. So it was quite easy because the content was really known to me. So mm. it was a case of, but again, the, and I think the reason that I struggle with dragon or otter is it goes too fast. My voice goes too fast and I don't capture it. Whereas if I go, right, sales and marketing is like golf. And I tell a wee story in my head, right, okay, why is sales and marketing like golf? Right, okay, most people don't know. And, and I can talk, it's like I'm talking to myself and that's where I slow down when I type because I'm in the third. It's as if I'm acting like being an author. So I'm in the third person when I write. So it's not really me that's writing, it's this third person in my head that's quite good okay. at this. Yeah. <laughs> do, do, oh, do they have a name? <laughs> no, 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 literally. Oh my God, now I've find another thing. But no, I, I, it is just, I feel that I'm writing through third person eyes and I think that's what makes it easier. So the grammar is not obviously going to be 100% and there'll be words missing, but the content is coming through the third person to me, to the page. So that's what made it a wee bit easier. Okay. But the confidence still wasn't there. So I, I decided I would get a ghostwriter. So first of all, I thought I'm going to get a ghostwriter. First of all, I thought I'll do, you know, I'll just narrate it into a dictaphone, send it off to the Philippines and I'll have a book. Woo! That didn't work. And then I thought, <laughs> oh, I'm going to have a ghostwriter. I'll just I'll get a ghostwriter to interview me. He'll take the notes. He'll write the book. Oh, voila, I'll have a book. And we invested quite a bit of money and the, the book came back. And my team are all like, that's rubbish. That's a load of rubbish. That just does not sound like you. It, it's not your tone. It's not the words you would use. This is rubbish. I said, well, what did we do then? They went, you're going to get off your backside and just write the book. So I did. And that's where I broke it into <laughs> chunks. Kaya, who was with me at the time, she would kind of edit it. And then we would say, right, what's the topic on this? And there would be bits. And I'd go, right, can you just type this bit? And, and she would type some of the bits. And and we cobbled together a book and the book just went mad. I mean, Secrets of Successful Sales was voted by the independent newspaper, one of the best business books written by a woman. I mean, literally, I can't, that's unbelievable. You know, you, you talk about the MBE, the fact that the independent are writing my book is the best business book, of the, one of the best business books is a year. It, it is extraordinary, extraordinary. So I think that that gave me confidence and and what we did was I was able to take the blogs mm. and and put them in, slot them in. So I'd already written quite a lot of the content anyway. It was just a case of joining the dots to make it a bit like a bit like a jigsaw puzzle, right? So when you get a box and you get the jigsaw puzzle, the first thing you do is do the edges. So when I wrote the book, the first thing I did was the shape of the book 
And then what I had to work out is where everything fitted from my content and how it all fitted in. So that's how we ended up with the first book. And then we just replicated it for the second one. Ah, okay. So, yes, yeah, so by the second one, you got the price. Did you use the same team or had you swapped team members? I did. Members no, Pat, so, that, that's interesting as well because the second one was written during COVID. And um, yeah. Kaya, who helped me with the first book, she'd left. I encouraged my team to leave because they're all young and there's a big world out there and they don't want to be stuck working for this old lady for the whole of their life. They want to go and find the world. So, um, Kaya was in Portugal and she was coming back. And she didn't have a job. And I said, well, like, I know that people are getting made redundant and furloughed, but would you like to start a new job working for me doing a new book? And she went, yes, please. And that's where we did smash it. And I'm so proud of it. I mean, I'm really, um, you know, I don't come from the world of personal development. I mm. um, had to do quite a lot of research on the book to find out the flow and how it all fitted together. Um, but I'm proud of the book. I'm proud of the app. And uh, yeah, I'm just really proud of them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, uh, it sounds great, actually, that you you clearly got a team and one person in particular that understands your voice. So I guess you sort of, the way I'm interpreting what you're saying, you sort of did a bit of a brain dub on a page and they would kind of tweak it to make it read right or sometimes would write bits you were struggling with. But it's your voice because they understand you so well and they're quite close to you. Matthew, I'll tell you this, right? So when it comes to blogs, so obviously now we do um, blogging content because we need to do it for the SEO for the website. Yes, and yeah. <laughs> I, will read, I will read a piece of content and I go, did I write that? And they're like, <laughs> no, you were training that day. We just wrote that as you. So my team literally can now write in Scottish. None of them are Scottish, but they can write in Scottish. And I'm so proud of them. I think that's a skill that... <laughs> You know, teamwork really does make the dream work. I couldn't be who I am without my team that support me and and not just support me, um, like support me in every way. A 360 support, they don't think I'm stupid. They think I'm brilliant and, and they don't care whether I can spell or I'm dyslexic. They think that it's great that I go out there and bring the money in from nowhere to pay the wages. And that's what really... I, you know, don't ever surround yourself by people who don't support you to that extent. Yeah, 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 totally. Uh, having ha- having people you mesh with is brilliant, isn't it? Like finding people that you complement each other and their skills of they could see your blind spots, you see theirs, and their skills complement yours is when it all just synergistically works. It's absolutely wonderful when yeah, it does that. And it's a brilliant yeah. team, and everybody just pulls one great direction. <laughs> Now that I was wondering because I was thinking books as, as a dyslexic person must be scary. So you had the framework for the books and you're, as you said, filling in the jigsaw. What sort of turns you on to which section to research in? Because I know you do, you really like your disc personality profiles that appear quite a lot in both books. And how did you yeah. kind of find out about that? It's it's kind of one of the main, it feels like one of the main pillars of both books is, it's, yeah. it's a book on sales, but it's really a book on either understanding yourself or understanding how other people are and then adapting your approach to suit that situation rather than just bulldozing through as you all the time. (laughs) Yeah, and and do you know what? So I think that we did DISC when I worked in corporate and I think it was a game changer for me to really uh, understand that I do have to adapt to build strong relationships. And I think of all my content, people love that. They really, Mm. really love that. And not everyone is blessed with emotional intelligence. You know, for some people, that's a natural ability. But again, if you look at the neurodiverse, um, you know, community, a lot of people, that's really not the strength that they've been blessed with in that space, that they struggle with emotional intelligence. And I think, um, but a lot of them, they enjoy learning how to learn new things. So if they've got the skills and it's like a process and they can follow a process, to get to the situation they want to get to, that I think giving them, arming them that with that knowledge and making it relatable again is something that I, I so I love the disc stuff. I love the psychology. And obviously um, I have not got a degree in psychology. So I try and <laughs> translate the academic aid psychology things. It's like Maslow's hierarchy and yes. like when I translate Maslow's hierarchy and means into like Tom Hanks cast away the movie. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, 
But for me, I think, yeah, that's just Castaway, my God. Like, he was at the top of the triangle and the plane crashed and it's like COVID. And, and, and again, these are the wee bits that people absolutely adore. So I think it's... Um, it, it's really, really clever. I'm fascinated in. Because mm. it's like, yeah, Master, I, I know, and I could visualise the pyramid, but directly you're like, well, let's talk about my friend Tom. My friend Tom, Tom Hanks. <laughs> and he she friends with Tom. I'm not really okay. My friend Tom Hanks in brackets. Not really my yeah. friend. I mean, yeah. it's interesting. Obviously, I narrated. You know, and you probably touch on this in a minute as well. But I narrated the audio books, and yeah, that, what, that's what oh. I've listened to. Yeah, yeah. But I had to do that. I like I, fear could have held me back from that. There was very good editing. Like literally, both books. <laughs> very good editing, big, and and I don't mean. I mean, they were just, they supported me un, oh, unquestionably. I was hard work and especially Smash It, because Smash It has got 71,000 words. Secrets of Successful Sales is only 46,000. So right. Smash It is like double the book. It's double the man than the other one was, you know? So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, when, the, when I was getting the price to um, from the recording studio, they said, how many thousand words? I said, 71. Oh, they went, that's two days. And I went, mm, <laughs> I think she took in four. And they went, no, 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 we do these all the time. I said, well, just out of interest, who 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 who, who does them all the time? Oh, you know, the actors, the voiceover people. Yeah, they're probably not dyslexic. Let's go for four days and book four days in the studio and touch wood, we got it done. A hard graft, but we did it in three. So, and literally every time I screwed up, they go stop, read it again, stop, read it again. Yeah, so we had to just... take it sentence by sentence. You have to because otherwise, I don't. I would never have got the book out. Yeah, I was just thinking, how's the pro? Because I was like, I list all the books all the time, which that's dyslexic hack, eh? And I'm I'm listening to it driving along and think nothing of it because obviously it's wonderfully edited and the story flows and it it works. And I'm like, well, yeah, because Alison does a lot of public speaking. But I just think as you were talking, actually, you're having to read your own book back to yourself and say it as the page says it, right? That's the problem. Yeah. Say it as the page has it. I can't read it as the page. Okay. Even though I wrote it, <laughs> I was missing words out or seeing words that aren't there and adding words and all the rest of it. And it's like, um, let's try that one again. It's <laughs> actually could be, you know, my friend Tom or whatever it is. So the, I think that the, if I had a pound for every time the editor said, let's try that sentence again. And mm -hmm. actually, can you stop adding the extra word so, <laughs> but in, a, in a nice way? So that was, uh, and I, I do public speaking, but I, I I know my content for that, you know, so I, I follow that visually in my head. So I'll know the, the points, like I'll know the cues of where to go. And that's why sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll use my slide pack as a crutch. My slide pack doesn't have any words on it, but it just makes me know what the next, the next, I mean, I suppose it's a bit like singing a song, isn't it? I've written the song, but sometimes like even the singers, like even Oasis get Wonderwall wrong. I'm a, <laughs> I, I think sometimes, you know, but that kind of thing, you can't get away with that if you're recording it, but if you're doing it live and you, you know, you add an extra, but after all, it's my Wonderwall, nobody's <laughs> going to question it if you're doing it live. But I'm just going to sing along anyway. It, yeah, the yeah. Like they they've all had too much to drink if it's like the Glasgow version of the band, so you're okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How did you find the performance aspect of that? If you're getting an editor to come in your ear and go, so you've just read the wrong sentence, you've just added extra words to the sentence, but you're mid-flow telling this story with all the texture and all the vocal inflection... How do you find re-recording it? Because imagine, I as find, you said, you kind I of... I that not bad. Yeah, but then I think that's where the performance side, when I'm speaking at events, that a lot of that is a performance. So a lot of the stuff, when you're, even if it's your own book, you're performing the book. Yeah. The bits that it's really tough and I had to focus, because there's obviously quite a few personal stories, you know, there like is, losing yeah. my eyesight and, you know, postnatal depression. You know, there's quite a lot of like really poignant parts yeah. And that was really hard to read. I think at the beginning, there's a narrative part that I, I lead in, you know, again, about when I had the birth of my first son, Kieran, and it's quite a strong narrative. And that was actually one of the first things I wrote because people wanted more of a personal story. They wanted to know more about me in this book. So mm. I had to deliver some of the things, but not just talking about myself, but 
what it means to them, what they can do, how they can find that strength. And I think that was, it was important, but I must say it was hard enough writing that, but see when you're reading that and you've been through, you're recreating really traumatic times in your own life, it's bad enough doing that if you're um, not dyslexic, but when you're dyslexic and you've got to keep that flow, you've literally, it was so tiring. Physically, I was exhausted because I had to stay on the focus. I couldn't, I had to really work so hard to try and read the sentence that I was physically exhausted by the end of it. Oof. Yes, yeah. And that you're saying about the post depression, that was really quite hard to listen to because it you could hear the emotion in it, but you couldn't hear the focus in it, which is a good thing. But actually, I hadn't thought of you sat there in a booth with a microphone thinking, having... As a dyslexic, I imagine you'd all come flooding back as strong images and you're Horrific. in that world, but can't deviate from what the page says as you start talking. Must no, you really. can't, literally. And I think that's the difference between reading and actually just being able to tell the story. It's reading. I must say that of all the things I've ever done in my life, I'd say that that's probably one of the most difficult is narrating those two audiobooks. Yeah, yeah. But congratulations on doing it because it's... If your audience is mostly dyslexic, then that's the very way they're going to consume the I content. I had to take one for the team. I <laughs> had to take one for the team. That's why more, more people need to download that book because I took one for the team. Yes, yes, yes. A bit of a slight left turn. Uh, you, you're saying about researching all the science uh, and uh, psychological theories and stuff to go into your book. How do you consume that content? Are you watching YouTube videos and audiobooks um, or are you reading it yourself? I'm curious to see how you then digest data before you it goes distilled through your brain and out into a book of your own. Oh, that's where Kaya comes in. So ah, okay. she'll read. Um, I mean, things like Maslow's, I had a, a rough overview, things like... Um, you know, the psychology and the brain and the fear, mm, the fight, mm. flight, freeze. And, you know, I tried to read The Chimp Paradox. I thought, oh, if I read that, I'll have more. Ah, just that wasn't working. And even <laughs> I tried to digest it in audible form. I downloaded it on audible and it was just too overwhelming. So I had to get Kaya to read that bit. You know, you do the, the heavy duty research. And then what we'll do is we'll verbally talk it through and come up with content that I can understand. Because a lot of the stuff I don't understand, which is why I think. Tom Hanks and Castaway is a perfect example because I didn't, I'm going like, oh, safety, security, oh, physiological, oh my God, I don't, what does that, what does that mean for the real people? What does that mean to me? I don't understand. And I think that's where I couldn't, so there's, there's bits in the book where we had to go quite deep on the, 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 re, the, the stuff behind it, you know, the psychology behind it. And those are the bits that Kaya would have written, you know, so she would have written those bits because that would just have taken forever because I didn't really understand the depth that that needed. So I said, like, you know, go into... I, I, I'll give you an example, a bit around um, high and low self-esteem. So the self-esteem yes. section. Yep. So, you know, I obviously understand high and low self-esteem, but I, I think it needed more... It needed more knowledge behind it rather than just my thoughts. And I think that the, 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 net, the level of knowledge came from Kaya. And then I took the bit into the wee stories that under, other people understand. So that's where the teamwork really came in and writing the books. Yeah, yeah. And I could I could see that. Yeah. And it's, it's really, <laughs> it seems like a really sort of good dyslexic trait, but yet being able to, but here's the information and bolting it to, as you say, cast away for the uh, Maslow. Yeah, but I think, think even when I was narrating as well, Matthew, that even reading those bits, I'm like, oh my God, this is dull. And I was really <laughs> struggling and I'd make the mistakes and there would be words, like big words that I didn't, I couldn't, I didn't with the word men. And oh, and even then it was like words, I was like, oh, I don't know how to pronounce that. And the editor would have to say, you know, whatever the word was. And but one of the words it was really funny because we talk about metathesiophobia a lot. This is like yes. some of the content that I talk about in training. And when it came to you know, I, I reeled off the, the uh, you know in front of the editor. I went, oh, metathesiophobia, and he went. And when I, the next time I made a mistake, and he stopped me, went, I can't believe that you could pronounce that word. And I'm like, oh, it's because I've had a lot of practice on that <laughs> one. So but it was other words that I really struggled with that are in the book. So, but again. You know, I'm, I think I'm really honest about it, Matthew, that, 
you know, I explain what's and all, where, where the book came from and how I wrote the book. It wasn't, it's not important how, you know, what the method of writing it is. It's ultimately that you get it out there. And I think it's like a lot of people would be um, hiding behind the fact that, oh, yes, I wrote it all myself. Look at me, give me a gold star. I'm like, well, yeah, I wrote these bits and I did this bit, but I had a wee bit of help with that one. And there's nothing wrong especially when you are neurodiverse, to ask for help. Yeah, can you help me with this? Because you're much better at it than me. Why would you not if you're still getting to the finish line? Exactly. And and actually, why would you hinder yourself by being in your own little narrow lane? Like, it, People are there to help you and <laughs> the people who don't want to help you probably you don't necessarily need in your social network in the first place. No, definitely <laughs> not. No, no, that's it's really fascinating. Actually, I hadn't hadn't quite thought of how difficult the audio book would be because I was like, you know, you've wrote it, you just narrate it because it's been written, edited, and is correct. <laughs> oh, oh dear! So, how did you come up with the idea of swapping from corporate world into your own business after after a while? Do you think that was a slight dyslexic thing? You were getting a little bit kind of frustrated with the corporate world. And you hear quite a lot of dyslexics start to struggle with not being able to take leadership and strive and do their own thing and do it in their own way. Do you feel that was something that was bubbling in the background? No, I think that that's the joy of working in sales. They kind of encourage you to be a bit renegade and as long as you're following the rules, as, you know, as long as you hit mm. your target and you're doing it legally, then people don't really <laughs> care. Um, but exactly. <laughs> at that time... I'm a fan of change. I think that's yeah. a, one of the things that I love change. I, in fact, I adore change. Change is something that I embrace. And again, I believe that comes from my dyslexia, that I'm not scared of change. I don't have metathesiophobia. <laughs> um, so uh, the company, big corporate companies are like elephants. You know, it takes them a long time to change direction and they've got all the stuff. Whereas... A small business is agile, they're like a gazelle. So I felt that my efforts would be better to teach smaller businesses how to sell. So it was a, you know, it was a wrench. I'd been with the company for 15 years and I loved working with them. Literally, it's hilarious because I've just been back working with their leadership team on a new strategy, which is lovely. And I'm so proud. You know, that's what I was saying when I was with them. I was really proud to have worked with them for such a long time and, and I wouldn't have a business if I hadn't been trained so well by them, because a lot of the stuff that I teach now is what I learned when I worked with them. So, um, but they weren't moving as quickly as I wanted to move. And that was, I knew that that was the time. But I think, you know, you look at dyslexic people, there's like, I think a lot of entrepreneurs are dyslexic. You know, I think it is a, a quality that it really helps you because I think you're not, Maybe the fear factor isn't as high. Maybe you're not as worried about, maybe you've had to deal with rejection and different things in your life and it gives you strength. I don't know. I mean, again, that's something I'd love to find out more about. But um, Yeah, me yeah. too. I, I kind of, a couple of theories and I'm not a psychologist or play one on the internet, but one thing I think maybe it's there's a level of grit if, because school didn't necessarily work for you. You kind of have that instilled level of, if you manage to get all right exam grades to get into university college or get into a job, there's that level of grit that's built in. And it's also, you spend your whole life as a young adult where the thing doesn't work for you anyway. So you spend all your time working out a way to hack your way around yeah, <laughs> the system you're I, in that doesn't work. And I think that's what entrepreneurship is. Entrepreneurship mm. is finding a problem and putting a solution in place. And if you've been doing that for your whole life, you think, oh, I don't understand why other people haven't done this. This is really easy. So I think there's <laughs> there's that optimism that you can achieve things because you, you you know you just believe that you can solve a problem and that's 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 entrepreneurship and that's what the the, the gift of dyslexia gives you I think I think so I was listening uh, there's a book called Grit by Angela Duckworth and uh, she's sort of talking through it and I'm like this does sound the grit scale is what she says is more of an indicator of success than talent alone. Mm. Um, and I think oh, you just sort of listen to it. Think, well, yeah, successful dyslexics I must have that by the bucket load because you just learned it from such a young age. Yeah, you just keep going, don't you? Okay, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to round this off with I have a few rapid fire questions that um, I'd like to ask all the guests. So I thought I'd fire them at you and see what you think. 
I'm nervous, I'm nervous, but I've got grit. I'll get through this. Yes, you will indeed. But um, they don't need quick answers. They're just quick questions from me. So first one, what prejudice do you have about dyslexia that has been proven wrong? I don't know if I have a prejudice against it. Uh, again, I, 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 it sounds a wee bit odd, but I don't know if I know enough about it. So it's not a topic, <laughs> although I am dyslexic. I haven't done yeah. much research on it. I've never written any, um, you know, I've never translated it into analysis and Edgarism. So I don't think I have any. <laughs> Maybe the prejudice lies with other people. Potentially, yeah. I'd be interested to see what the Alice and Edgarism would be. You have to let me know if you think of one. Maybe that's the third book. <laughs> I think that's the third book. <laughs> there you go. Just write it down. The trilogy, Alice and Edgar, the trilogy. I'll find some big balls for dyslexia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Alison's dyslexia balls. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Next question. How would you describe dyslexia to somebody now if an alien come down? Oh, I definitely think it's a gift and a superpower that makes us think differently and do things in a less conventional way to get better results. Mm. I agree. Um, and the last one, because this is the Dyslexia Life Hacks show, any Dyslexia Life Hacks? <laughs> yeah, I think um, focus completely on the things that are not dyslexic. Focus on the things that you are brilliant with and then the things that you really struggle with. Well, why do you have to do them yourself? Just find somebody that can help you with them. And I think I've proved that. I think I don't even have to... Um, see that in a theory I've proved that firsthand that you can do that yes yes I have a hack on the website called you've got a friend in me that covers that kind of point you're totally right and I, th I think actually you really illustrated it quite well while we've been talking how that really really helps out is there anything else you'd like to add or any other things you'd like to say before we sort of sign off uh, no, just if anybody um, has enjoyed listening to the podcast of the books, uh, Secrets of Successful Sales and Smash It, The Art of Getting What You Want are both available on Amazon and really easy to find. Uh, there is computers now and I am available. <laughs> um, so on social media, I am at the Alison Edgar and on LinkedIn, I'm Alison Edgar MBE. So I'm quite, I am quite easy to find. If MDs enjoyed the podcast, get in touch with me. And if I can help in any way, then just please let me know. Oh, thank you. I will also link all that in the show notes, which will be available at dyslexialifehacks.com forward slash podcast. And thank you very much for coming on the show, Alison. You are very welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Excellent. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.